Relina, yo sí. ¿Cuándo llegaste? El, no, yo llegué desde el sábado. Ah, qué rico. Sí, desde el sábado a Houston. Estuve ahí un día y medio. Ajá. Ya me vine para acá. Mis hijos no tenían clases ni lunes ni viernes. Yo también me hubiera encantado venir más tiempo. Pero... Sí. La verdad es que está increíble ahorita el clima. Sí, está increíble. Pero... Sí. Yo ahí frío los primeros días. Sí, es lo que...
sim. México, zero. Ok, so, good uh, morning, everyone. It's time for us to get started with today's uh, uh, session for the symposium uh, on adaptive reuse. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, room. We are in Goldsmith 3.120, 1, the main lecture room in Goldsmith Hall at the University of uh, Texas School of Architecture. Uh, my name is Benjamin Ibarra. I, have, I am a faculty member here and director of the Historic Preservation Program and in collaboration with uh, the architecture program and the Mexico Center, Lilas Benson Mexico Center, is that we uh, had the opportunity to bring together a number of uh, uh, very ac accomplished uh, architects and designers that have done uh, work in the context of uh, adaptive reuse, building conservation. Um, uh, this uh, also, I want to thank personally here, Rodrigo Rivero Borel, uh, who has been instrumental in putting this uh, group together for the work that they do in Mexico, but also to come here to UT. And uh, <clears throat> so it has been a, a good effort for, for having this uh, discussion going on. Uh, we, uh, in the external preservation program, but also you know, in the context of uh, architecture, believe that uh, historic preservation is a very challenging field and it's a, they have a lot of opportunities in the context of design. As I mentioned yesterday, our goal here is to bring the conversation alive and think about what the role of the designer is in the conservation of historic properties. Um, generally speaking, I think that there is a misconception that uh, looks at a uh, historic preservation and the architects who design or work with historic buildings as uh, those who perhaps don't have the skills to design, design something new or are not sensitive enough to do something that is progressive, that is uh, avant-garde, that is cutting edge. Uh, however, I, I personal, uh, personally believe it's the opposite. I think that uh, in order to address uh, carefully and with uh, sensitivity the issues that um, we need to address with uh, historic buildings. Uh, the designer needs to be a very strong designer, a very good designer, and there are plenty of, of, of opportunities for designers uh, when working in a built environment, pre-existing built environment, and even, even more if it's part of our, of our, cult of our cultural heritage. So that's why we are here, because we want to uh, bring this conversation live to have uh, discussions. We had an excellent conversation yesterday uh, with um, Valeria Valero, who is the director of uh, INA's uh, uh, Building Conservation Office, and uh, the framework that she presented, how we work in terms of uh, establishing rules and elements that are important, um, uh, and also how they need to be sometimes questioned and challenged uh, 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 in order to address the needs of the 21st century and people who actually inhabit the buildings, right? So uh, with this in mind is that we are hoping for, an, we are not hoping, we are having an excellent lineup today. We have Carlos Bedoya who is sitting just next to me right here, right? We have Gabriela Chegaray who is going to come next. And we have Francisco Pardo, all uh, internationally known architects who have uh, demonstrated not only in Mexico, but also abroad their capacity to lead a, a very accomplished design projects. So without further ado, I think I'm gonna pass the microphone to um, Carlos. Um, and so he can take care, uh, he can start his presentation. I'm just gonna set it up over here. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask if each of our presenters just to briefly introduce themselves, uh, uh, so we know, uh, uh, yeah, who is. Uh, sorry, I'm double tasking, and sometimes I get a little. <laughs> a little <clears throat> Let me just bring this thing over here. 
so it's not in the way. And um, okay, Carlos, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having us here. I mean, uh, on behalf of my business partners and myself, thank you very much for for uh, to the University of Texas, to Rodrigo Rivera who is a colleague and also a friend, Benjamin, and all the people who organize and it's involved in the organization of this symposium. And just like a brief introduction of my office, uh, we are a Mexican-based office. Uh, we are four business partners, uh, two from Mexico and one from Belgium and the other one from uh, Argentina. And we have been uh, practicing for uh, over like 15 years. We also have like a platform called Liga. It's a platform of architecture in where we try to create like a discussion, a dialogue uh, about architecture. So, uh, and we have been working in a wide range of projects, which goes from uh, like um, museography to like uh, in this case like uh, like housing projects, uh, cultural projects, uh, infrastructure, and uh, even like in this case adaptive uh, reuse uh, projects as well. So uh, I want to share with you two projects that has to do with the, this topic. Uh, adaptive reuse, but uh, when I was invited to to talk about uh, our projects and how we uh, have faced these commissions, uh, just uh, like um, some questions like came up, and maybe they they are gonna be answered one way or another with, with the projects I'm gonna show. Maybe some of them they are not gonna be answered. But I think it's important. I mean, I, I, it's, there are some things that just like are triggered by this topic, and I think it's important to think about them. And maybe there are a lot of questions that I mean that they are not here, but uh, this is some of them which just like came up once I started to think about the project. So, for instance, I, I started to think about which is the role of the construction in the over explosion of a raw materials and the implications of this over explosion. I mean, like we, do we have to build always from scratch or do we have to reuse sometimes? I mean, I think that we have to find that balance, but uh, maybe it's not always the solution to demolish, to start from scratch building. And, and then there is another important part that, uh, which is like, uh, to think which are the responsibilities of the governments for generating laws that contribute to the health development of the construction sectors. For instance, in Mexico, I'm gonna explain with the project that I'm gonna show you. Uh, sometimes when you build and you reuse like a existing building, you 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 are allowed or you don't have to build like a parking space so the the government encourage you to 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 reuse like some existing structures by allowing you to get rid of these like parking spaces and encouraging the citizens to use like another uh, ways to commute within the city and what are the environmental consequences once you you know, or what are the health consequences or the social consequences? I mean, when you like over uh, exploit like uh, materials, how you are affecting like the, the earth, the ground, the, the soil, the, the cities, and also all the dyna dynamics, like social dynamics that are created by this kind of like uh, explosion and, 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 and behaviors. And what is the importance of the uh, historical memory. I mean, not only because uh, they have a value and because they are beautiful buildings, but why it's important to to keep like uh, these historical buildings uh, in terms of social identity or, or other things. And 
the importance of uh, the generation of democratic spaces, which is uh, the boundaries between public and private, and which is the opportunity we have, like by reusing buildings to 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 encourage and to like this relationship, how we understand with the, this relationship, and for sure. Uh, the topic of gentr gentrification, once you start to intervene like a neighborhood, how it is affected by, by the, the projects you, 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 you build there. So having said that, the first project I'm gonna share with you is Manuel Dublan, which is a housing project. It is in Mexico City. And it is in a, I mean, I think it's like, common that in cities, in big cities like Mexico City, the cities start to develop like in different places and suburbs and all of a sudden like uh, all like neighborhoods start to be abandoned and, and, and uh, yeah, like, like uh, without like maintenance and so this is the case of this neighborhood in where the project is located, but it's like a uh, like an important neighborhood within the city structure. So, and this is also something important about this collaboration that we had with Pre Urbano, with Rodrigo and Alberto, and because uh, they don't only choose like a existing uh, projects or houses or infrastructure, they try to understand how the building can affect and how it can uh, contribute to a change within the city. I mean, it's not only about the project in itself, but how this project can contribute contribute to change something within the uh, social and, and urban structure. So this is like a project which is in a neighborhood which is in the within the city almost in the middle of the city and um it's it's uh, nearby to uh important like uh, infrastructure buildings or spaces such as museums or uh, education like buildings uh parks or even like uh, um, other neighborhoods, uh, the 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 building is here. I, I you cannot see my course, but, but it's in the middle of the image of the slide, and uh, it's also. I mean, also it, they 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 chose like this uh, house and this plot because it was also not only an important like uh, neighborhood, but but also in a place in where you could like commute easily either by uh, on food or 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 in bicycle or even like uh, taking like public transportation so it was also an important decision of why they choose like this uh, plot uh, so it was like a 19th century house like a two story uh, house uh, the typical house which was uh, designed around a uh, patio. So all, all the spaces look towards this patio and, and all the spaces are organized through this patio. Uh, it was like this kind of uh, buildings which was built with these thick walls and like small openings and uh, around this patio. And also back then, in, I mean, in the 19th century, they used to build like these beautiful, like almost double height spaces, which are not built like anymore because they are like maybe too expensive or whatever. So, but back then they used to, to build like this kind of spaces. Um, this, this is the house when we, the first time we went to visit it. And there are also like some things that were used that are part of the identity of the house, which is part of this historical memory, such as these like, uh, again, the patio and the columns, the staircase, the handrails, uh, like some things which are like a part of the identity of this, 
at least this house, this. And uh, these corridors, because all, all these houses used to be organized and by these corridors, I mean, you sometimes, sometimes you could not uh, go through the house from one room to the other. So you used uh, these corridors, these exterior corridors to connect to different spaces. And uh, yeah, this is like the, how we found like the, the house. And uh, for instance, we also try to understand some elements which are, were important for us as a part of this like historical memory of the house. And then we try to preserve them as a part of the uh, new project. So other thing which is important is that, uh, again, Reurbano, who invite us to, to design this project, they always try to keep us as much as possible the existing structure. And they encourage us to keep like the 100% of the existing house in Mexico. And I don't know if other places, they uh, usually ask you to preserve at least the facade and then to get rid of the rest of the building. But in this case, we were encouraged and we, we were like agreed to keep the whole house and trying to get a, take advantage of the, the qualities of the, of the, of the for existing uh, structure. And then uh, over this like existing structure, we build like a four story building, housing uh, building. We did like uh, this setback. So on the one hand, we can create like a sort of uh, respect relationship between the uh, past with the present. But by doing like this setback, we were also able to, to use like the rooftop of this uh, existing building as a outdoor spaces, terrace and so on. Basically the idea of the project was, it was trying to create like a, how to enhance like the uh, past with the present, how we can create like a relationship in where we can take advantage from both, from the past and the, and the contemporary architecture. And then we built like the rest of the, the floors of the new apartment uh, building. Uh, and other important like uh, element of the project, it was the, the, all the circulation system. We preserved like existing staircase in the ground floor. Then uh, we like uh, create like this uh, interior staircase. And finally, we create like this, this we design like this, like suspended like, staircase. So it was important not only to connect like the whole project and the past with the present, but also to create like a sort of promenade, like a walk within the building and try to rediscover uh, all the elements of the, of, of the building and how you can like uh, appreciate like the different moments of the, of the project from the ground level to the top. Uh, and although the, the, the house and the structure of the house is pretty much the same, we were able to create like a, a different apartment. I mean, every apartment within the, this building, which are like 17 apartments, they are completely different. And they sometimes they use like the rooftop of the existing house, or they sometimes they use like the corridors uh, as a, outdoor terraces. Uh, so this is the, the project. Other import, important thing about uh, the project, I would say is that the uh, spaces that look towards the street, they are like retail spaces. So one way or another, it's like the, it's, it's a spacing where the project tried to have like connection with the street and with the citizens and the inhabitants of the, neighborhood and then uh, the rest of the spaces are like these uh, apartments or housing units. So in the ground floor, they can like uh, use the patio as an extension of the apartments. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, we, 
uh, preserve the patio and the and this beautiful tree. And then the second level, and we preserve also like the original staircase. And then we have in the uh, right hand floor plan, we have like this staircase, which is within the building. So it's it, it was also important to create like this, like a stairways system because allow us to, to perceive and to have like a different spe special experiences within the building. And then once we start to go up, we have like this like suspended and sculptural uh, staircase that connects you with the rest of the floors. But if you see like each apartment, although like the structure is like um, very regular, in the end, they end up being like completely different. They can use like the typical walkways as a extension uh, of, of, of their spaces, like uh, terraces. And this is the uh, stair, stair, stairway system, which uh, start from the ground floor with the original staircase and start to go to the next level to this like uh, indoor uh, stair, and then keep going up uh, with the, this suspended uh, cantilever staircase. And then what I mentioned previously in the other slides that uh, since we preserve like the, the whole uh, for existing house, we are able to have like these apartments with double heights and even to place some mezzanines. Other important thing is that we don't have like a parking space because the government allows you to build like this. I mean, in order to preserve like existing house, you are able to get rid of the parking. But in that way, you also, I mean, you are encouraged to reuse like some existing structures within the city, but you are also encouraging the people, the city sense to use other ways to commute within the city. So these are parts of the regulations that in, where I think the government can contribute to, to keep trying to reuse some some structures and buildings within, within the city. This is the this staircase in cantilever, which allows you, I mean, it, it works as a sort of identity part of the building, but also allows or, or try to encourage the people to walk through the building and discover like different like uh, spaces within the, the building. And this is from the ground floor and shows how we preserve the patio and the existing tree and how all these spaces from the ground floor and the second floor can enjoy from this patio and from the tree and how we preserve like the columns, the uh, cornices, the, uh, and some other elements, for instance, also the blue because the house, it had like this blue color since the beginning, so we use a part of the identity of the building as a part of the memory of the building in the new and the new project. And these are some of the apartments. So if you see like these apartments, which are in the existing house, they have like a, almost like a double height. And then the new building, which is connected by this like, uh, cantilever uh, staircase, they are like completely different. The, the, the special qualities and the heights. We try to design also the roof so we can get rid of the ceiling and we can have like at least, at least more height because uh, in the end it's important. It's, it has to be something that responds to the needs of the city and but also is part of a business so we have to take care also i mean that it works for all the people who is involved in this like uh, kind of projects and uh, then i'm gonna share with you another project which is called uh, rooftop Prime. this is a a project another uh, client asked us he bought like these two properties which were like also a 19th century properties and he tried to to create like a to preserve 
the whole uh, property and try to create like a, a public uh, program project. Uh, again, these two uh, houses, they used to uh, be organized by patios. All the spaces look towards these patios. But in Mexico, it used to rain at least half a year. So, I mean, he wanted to create like this public program, but also he needed to rent as much as possible these spaces. But so the patios, they were not able to be rented when it was raining. So he asked us to design like a roof to cover the patios, but he didn't want to lose the properties of a patio, which is to have like a natural sunlight, uh, ventilation, illumination, and so on. So he asked us to, to cover these three patios, which are in the building, in the building which is in the left hand side. Uh, and this is part of the facades. They, he wanted to keep it like they, they were. So we had to be careful of what we built on this uh, rooftop. And so we were asked to cover these three patios. And what we decided to do, it was to design just like a single, uh, this single section. We tried to design it as thin, as, as light as possible because, because two reasons. The first one it was because we didn't want to design something heavy because it was like an old building and it could be solved but we had to create like columns if, if we wanted to do something heavier, which goes all the, all the way to the ground floor. And so we wanted to, to design something super light in order to, uh, yeah, not to have to build like a, a structure, like a, a complex a structure. And then the other important thing to, uh, to design something lighter, as this roof, it was because we wanted to create like a contrast between the uh, ancient architecture and the contemporary architecture. Sometimes I, I think that you can create like a dialogue by mimic like the old architecture with the new one. In this case, we consider it was better to, to create like this dialogue between both by having a contrast. So this is the only thing we decide with design I mean this section together with the engineers. And then it had like just like a, all of a sudden like some iterations depending on the spacing where it, it, it was like placed. For instance, we have like this like staircase which goes from the ground, ground floor to the top. So we just extend like the structure, but basically it is the same uh, uh, structure. Uh, and then we decided also to, instead creating like three different roofs, we decided to have like one single roof. So we can cover the patios, but also we can cover some spaces within the rooftop. So we, we create like another space of opportunities in the rooftop, like, a, cover areas that could be used during the whole day. So this is the main facade where you can see barely like the top of the, of the roof. But once you get into the, to the rooftop, you can see like, like this section that I showed you before in the previous slide. And this section repeat all the way to the, to the, to the main facade along the, the rooftop. Uh, and it, I mean, it's like a pitch roof, like a very like a regular pitch roof. And it has, it's asymmetrical a because uh, uh, try to answer to the orientation of the, of the roof. So uh, in the right hand side, you have like sort of double skin that allows you to protect the, space from the sunlight in the left hand side is just like one scheme because it doesn't like get the sunlight directly during the day depending on the hour and uh, this is the view from the bottom 
and it's interesting because depending where where you are standing, the you you start to have like a different relationship with the roof. So uh, the one the right side is a photo taken in the ground level, and then the the one in the left side is in the first level, or from the rooftop from one of the patios or from the uh, rooftop space. And also the rhythm of the structure, it has to do all, uh, for sure with the structural, structural design, but also with the uh, panels, the translucent panels that we used to allow the sunlight getting there. And also allows to organize the, the lighting system and also they were part of the aesthetic of the building in itself. Uh, and it was interesting too that although it's like a very simple structure that allows to cover like all these uh, patios, it also changed and changed its relation with the context depending on the hour of the day. So, so sometimes it looks like more solid or in the sunset, the light goes through the structure, allowing you to see like the complexity of the of the of this structure. And also at night, it looks even more like a sort of lamp. Or and finally, I'm gonna share with you this video. And, and
thank you. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Eh, tenemos un uh, par de minutos para... Oh, sorry. I'm taking... <laughs> so we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. If you want, we have a question from people online. Let me, let me make sure I read it to you. Uh, something about the first project. No, it's necessarily oh, because uh, it probably can go back to the slide. So it's a beautiful project, the first project. Interested to hear about the structural <laughs> engineering collaboration, collaborations and challenges. Uh, how did you determine the structural capacity for the addition, and I suppose also for the existing building, and how much reinforcement, reinforcement was required? Okay, it was like uh, completely separated. I mean, we realized that we could not use like the same, the, the, the existing, structure of, of the house so we had to design like something which just go through the existing house like completely independently so we had just to organize that this structure that one way or another belongs to the i think the plans show it yeah if you want, if you want to go yeah i can yes i think i want to make it like faster Maybe here. Yes, here, maybe. Yes, exactly. So here are the, uh, if you see, there are like some like bigger things, which are the columns of the building, the new building. Yeah, you have so plan to go back, I think, back and like. This one, another one back, back, back. Kind of like three slides back when you, that one. Yeah, that one. That one shows on the upper left corner. Yeah, it was, yeah, it, it's more or less like the conceptual idea because it was the first project we shared. But yeah, basically this is how it works. It's like a structure of the new building which goes through the existing house. So one way or another, they work like completely separated. Okay, so if you have to carve out for foundations and everything. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It's super interesting because one way or another, the, the existing house is completely like uh, separated by this new structure. Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah. If it affects, yeah, I I don't know because uh, I mean in terms of the uh, the sign, I would say that it's like another like uh, kind of uh, spaces that you can offer to different profile of people who is like more aware of what is going on within the city that they don't want to use like that much the car to commute and they are trying i mean they are, they are in the same line of thought in where they are trying to they know that they, there are a lot of pollution so i think that there is like a market for this kind of profile and they do appreciate i was there there is a friend who bought apartment there he invited me to to have a dinner with him and so on and i think that they they he was like really enjoying to be there so i think that there there is like a people who who are looking for this kind of spaces and with this quality and trying to transform the way they used to live so i think that at least in terms of architecture i think that fulfill but we have to. Okay, we have time for one more question. We have one from, from the internet and then you, is that okay? I was wondering mm -hmm. how you guys meet the, the requirements for accessibility um, and because you ended up having this six story building. Um, were you required to use people in elevators? Uh, for those of you uh, on Zoom, 
The question is about accessibility, how they uh, fulfill the requirement on accessibility. Yeah, this is a good question. I, I, I do believe that for sure we have to provide from access in any building to, to any kind of people. But here, the important thing is that I, I, I do believe too that maybe there should be like some uh, spacing where the people can go freely. And we try to do this by having, for instance, the, the first floor like available for, for people who cannot like go. Because the thing is that sometimes it's like almost impossible to have ramps, good ramps with good like a slope for people who need to go. I mean, to 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 go like without a mechanical system to all the floors, it would be like almost impossible because if you want to do like a ramp with a good slope, maybe you could take like, I don't know, like, so we try as much as possible, but yeah, in, in that case, for instance, all the ground floor is accessible because it sounds like super logical to do that like that, but in Mexico, because uh, the kind of soil, you have a lot of steps. So in the end, at least here, we try to make this ground floor accessible for, for all the people. You fulfill the code to the first floor. If I may yeah. share something with that. Yes. From the developer's perspective, uh, it's, it's little because the units on, on, the, on the top floor are the two story units. So, so you comply with the regulation because you have access to the, the units from top, from a uh, from the fifth floor, and also as, as as Carlos is saying, you have a complete accessible first or ground floor, and that also helps because in the end this is a small, a small project. So you have, uh, I think it's two or three units in the ground floor, and and it's a uh, seventeen units. So you have a uh, one fifth uh, proportion of accessible units. So it's. It's also a, a matter of scale. Like you, if you put all the burden of all of the, reg the regulations to small projects, then probably they won't be even feasible. And and but if you have a two hundred unit uh, project, then then you should uh, be expected to to comply with with a hundred percent accessibility to all the units because because of the scale of what you're doing. But, but in these cases, I think uh, <coughs> these kind of exceptions are. Okay, so we are going to jump. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. We are going to jump to uh, the last question from Julio Lopez online. Julio, please go ahead. Yeah, and hello. Good Good morning. Um, just my question is, uh, yesterday we listened to the INA uh, conference, and it seems to me that it was a little bit complicated to, to, to do some modification or no, no, not complicated. Just it seems there is a lot of uh, documents that you need to apply and quite complex. Um, and when I see the rooftop, for me was my question is how difficult it was to get the approval for Nina. Uh, it seems to me that it's yeah, it's I don't know. It's, it's something that you added to the house, on top of the house, and an historical building. Um, just I'm, I can't imagine the 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 process of getting the approval of all this stuff that you added on top. So um, yeah, to mm -hmm. me, it's, uh, how difficult it was to get this, this the go ahead on this, on the on your rooftop. It, it, it was not that difficult because it, since it was, I mean, there, there are like some kinds of like uh, uh, rules and restrictions you have to follow. So, and we, 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 we were not like uh, affecting like the main facade, so we hadn't this problem. We, since we designed like this super light structure, we were not affecting like the uh, structure of the existing uh, house. So in the end, in this case, it was easy. It, it was more difficult in the case of the Manuel Dublin house. We spent there like uh, one year or even more. Yeah, like, like uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. We have having ah, three years, like having like this, like conversations with 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 Ina, uh, in, in, yeah, Ina in this case, uh, because there we 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 were building like a four story building uh, above on on the existing house, but in the case of the rooftop, it, it was part also of the strategy that we we didn't want. I mean, 
if we had to build like some something heavier, which need like a sort of columns that goes all the way down to the ground floor, I think that it, it, it uh, had been a, a problem. But since we design like this like super light structure that you can even imagine that you can get rid of it like easily. So it was not a problem. It was, uh, uh, it's reversible. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. All right, thank you very much. We need to move on uh, for the next presentation, but Carlos, excellent. excellent thank job. you. We are going to, uh, I'm gonna set it up for Gabriela here. <clears throat> All right, so this video. Okay. Thank you. So Gabriela Chigaray. Hi everyone. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, Benjamin, for putting all this panel together in addition with Rodrigo. Thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. And also thanks for the people that are here, Afasim and some other people online. Do you want me to? Uh, yes, and okay. yeah. um, so today under the context of the symposium, adaptive reuse, recycling old buildings, um, we pretty much thought about the idea of cycle. And rather, and our work in the office and also the way we like to think we're looking towards the world is through the idea of cycles rather than lineal processes. And with this, um, more questions come to... It's not moving. And with these um, questions or inquiries arise under the idea of, of how to re-inhabit. So how does architecture adapt to new manners of inhabiting? How do we break with all behaviors that architecture has imposed and reaffirms in its form and its, and its structures? What happens when an emblematic building collapses? In 1902, the bell tower of St. Mark's collapsed in Venice. <clears throat> and that event triggered a series of debates that questioned reestablished ideas about architectural conservation. On the one hand, there were those who supported the need to restore such emblematic element within the city's imaginary. And on the other hand, there were those against its reconstruction because it constituted a forgy of history. Finally, the decision was to build the bell tower Dovera Ecomera, which is um, as it was and where it was originally. And following this, the principles of the historical restoration movement prevailed in Italy um, until maybe even now. It's the way how we understand the, the actions or the way to preserve a building. In 1964, uh, Cesare Brandi, an art critic and historian, a specialist in conserv conservation and restoration theory, changed the majority view on the restoration of the bell tower, stating that it was indeed necessary to, to build a new tower, but not exactly as the one that collapsed. Instead, what, what, what had to be reestablished was the idea of the bell tower following on the idea of the present. With these questions, the theory of restorations goes from something technical to a philosophical question. And this is where we stand in the office when we approach to any project. Like we acknowledge a previous history, even on empty plots. And these philosophical reflections consist of considering the building to be restored as a work of art and not only as a historical document. Those questionings manifest an increasingly complex reality when facing a persistence and deciding what to do with it. 
especially since the discourse are fragmented and the reality and the material reality is crossed by the by diverse social conflicts uh, on the part of all of those who are involved in the process of, of, of interacting with that persistence. And we've seen this with the previous project that there are like all the institutions involved, the architects, the developers, and the city on its own. And some theorists have considered this as critical conservation, or as Otero suggests, experimental preservation, which takes the tangent of the dialectic, what to restore or not to restore, shifting the focus towards the specificities of each case, place, ideology, context, etc. By this, we recognize a critical action about its questions, because it questions the very notion of conservation, preservation, and it becomes self-reflective. And cases under such lenses generate a simultaneous dialogue with the fragments of history at different levels. What it means to be fragile. How can we test an object or building that it's over-determined of meaning or with a culture or identity that defines it? Attempts to test what you preserve in the attempt to attack it. And by the idea of attack, I mean a way, of, a way to question the demand of reuse. Um, I will present four projects and I hope it's not too dense because I took a lead of them in the, um, I, I, like I took on ideas, uh, fragmented ideas from the text or the book um, by Aldo Rossi, The Architecture of the City. So I will sort of like introduce them with certain extracts from that um, book. Cities are in constant change. As Aldo Rossi points out on, in Architecture of the City, it is important to understand the city and its construction, not as fixed entities, but as subjects that undergo continuous transformations. That which is part of the city at the material level or at the level of ideas is resignified over time. Objects acquiring new uses are modified to accommodate new experiences or even disappear them to integrate new forms that respond to the needs of the city's inhabitants. Mexico City has experienced centuries of modifications and transformations. The historic center embodies the collective memory of an entire nation, and it is associated with layers on top of layers of history. In Rossi's terms, the locus is what identifies the relationship between memory and place in the city. In the case of Mexico City, the locus of the city's commercial collective memory can be identified in the historic center, a place that has been a center for exchange of goods since its very foundations. Over the time, the commercial typology has changed going from the pre-Hispanic tianguis to the current shopping malls. However, during the first, the first half of the, cent of the 20th century, a typology that was observed mainly in, in European cities took place in Mexico City, which is the commercial passage or the arcade or these pasajes. <clears throat> there are some of those examples um, in the city center, as you can see all the red, um, elements there, and we work at Pasaje Turbide. Pasaje Turbide, it's, um, it's a passage or this arcade that connects two streets, um, Gante and Bolivar, and one of them is pedestrian and it's perpendicular to a Madero, which is like the main pedestrian street in the, in the city center in Mexico. The initial project by Cunga y Capilla aspired to, collect, to connect the whole block from the interior of the arcade, providing access to the four streets, as you can see in the highlighted in black um, walls. Uh, and he aspired to, to provide access for, for, for the four streets towards the interior. However, this never happened and only two floors were built, which one of them ended up being demolished um, at some point. And the only connection, as I told you before, was the horizontal from these two streets. Um, so the transformation of Madero as a pedestrian street ended up beating up this type of commerce where the small scale for boutiques have no cavity with the dimension of the global stores and the demands of the public. Over the last 20 years, the Pasaje Turbide has been abandoned, leaving aside the potential that the plot has of densifying this, this site up to the six levels as the, as the, as the whole block has already six levels uh, in like the rest of the constructions um, with today's regulations. So our first approach was how to rethink or reinterpret not only um, the remains of the, of the structure, like in architecturally speaking, 
but also the idea of the program. What could this house? Uh, so we started questioning um, and reaffirming that the ground floor plans should recover the commercial passage. However, breaking up these smaller dimensions and trying to make larger spaces that not necessarily would address the boutique idea as it was before. And then in the following level, we suggested a connection to, to the Palacio Turbide, which is, which is something that it was once connected and you could have seen in the images before to connect it, but not with, um, with an interior of a gallery, but rather like an, an exterior platform that it could be understood as a plaza or a garden for a sculpture and for exhibitions that are connected with, the, with that um, extension or since they are like sort of like partners and both of the projects are connected or used to be connected. And then in the following levels, we suggested um, a program that would address office, but more in an environment of co-working and also housing, but more with the idea of short stays and the, the hotel program, the, the program for tourism. The project also seeks to unveil the constructions of the city by exposing the historical times within the architectural elements that prevailed in the building. And here we can see um, in the floor plan, the old San Francisco convent is part or used to be part of the site that it's in red. And there are still those uh, vestiges uh, or remains from that um, historical period. So we wanted to, to sort of like strip the, ruin, the ruins of the convent of San Francisco and to create like the access with those remains of a structure while also maintaining the article um, language along the contemporary project. And with the, well, the contemporary intervention. And our intervention was mainly about the structure. Like how could we house six levels on top of this um, one level passage? And it had to do a lot with the question that someone asked before to Carlos, like how do you, um, put on top, like, how do you mount a structure on top of something that it's supposed not to be touched? And that's where we ended up um, having difficulties and the project sort of like stopped, not because it's not able or possible to do it, but because of the space where this project is, which is the city center. And we know like layers on, below layers, there may be remains of the Aztec empires. So, um, at the end, the, the clients got sort of like demotivated for several reasons, but mainly regarding with the, with the fact that the institutions in charge um, of urban and territorial development, as well as those related to the cultural heritage, do not have the guidelines or the certainties to, to give confidence to an investment process that exists or extends or inter intersects with other governmental periods. So um, at the moment, it's a project that it's a stop because of all those excavations for the, mm. for, the, for the structure. And we cannot go on unless a stable go government is in charge. And there are like possibilities to provide certainties that if the project um, starts, it will end up getting built the whole way. So another project, it, this is a cinematographic production. And going back to, to Ross's remarks, he postulates that a historical analysis of the forms of a city, for example, the plots and divisions of land can reveal the evolution of a city from an architect, from an agricultural condition, passing through the colony, the, col the consolidation of a period up of the urban present. And these traces can be, can be present in the history of the distribution of urban property, while also showing the social changes that manifest themselves in the material form. In this case, the, the project for the Productora, the, the site is located in the, within a polygon um, considered to be historic, a historic zone. It is in the back um, part of this convent. And the, the project, as we can see here, it's, it indicates like the preliminary investigation indicates that the property uh, the existing construction began in the 17th century and at the same time as the Convento del Carmen, being part of the surrounding lands of the enclosure convent. 
And if we zoom into the central part where the convent is, the in in red in highlighted in red is the is the volume that it could have been the grain cellar um, or the spaces for rest for the monks. And this this site was bought from from a man in the television industry who then changed this red volume to be his house or his residence for leisure. And then um, as you can see here in the photos, like the whole sort of like space looks towards these walls, the property, um, like we can see the stone walls adjoining the atrium and the iglesia and are the oldest elements of the existing building, which aren't, which aren't really part of the, of our project, it's more of like the boundary. And that, um, that boundary of those walls over the years possibly began to be divided by the because of the reform laws and the Carmelite properties were dissolved. It was then that it needed to be delimited, the property, the property needed, needed to be limited. So the volume known to be the grain cellar became this residential. And it's also sort of like seen and it's known that the pavilion with this and cantera columns, wooden beams, and the red brick walls were the were the, the event venue. The height and width of the openings, as well as the levels and thickness of the walls, do not correspond to the original project on site or on site. And the ornaments of the facade, as you can see in the last image, um, they sort of insinuate to be acquired after the the building was done. Like it's a it. They're not really part of the historical moment of the construction, but as part of a decoration and exaltation of the residential and um, property years later. So what we did here, it's um, we conserved the facade, we conserved, we conserved the volume on the left, the one that used to be known as the grain cellar. We removed the, the newest addition to allocate a new project. The, that, the, that it would have a connection with the previous part. And we played with the unevenness of the ground floor, emphasizing a higher platform that would allow us to put um, a lighter volume. Uh, and it would also allow us to do less excavation for the foundations of it and to receive the wooden structure um, that would house this sort of like pavilion. The volume takes the, the space of the previous event venue pretty much, retracting it from its four sides. So it's sort of like central and it has like these separations towards the, the atrium walls. And, and well, we being, being a cinematographic production space, the spaces um, that predominates are meeting rooms or space to works where various agents can and actors may gather in concert relation to this sort of like stone and persistent that surrounds it. It is evident that the building has undergone various adaptations over centuries and it has been restored and refurbished on several occasions. But this time what we try to do is like to sort of like insert a light structure with certain concrete elements um, in the middle of all this. And even though we agreed with the institutions in charge that the ornamental details will be restored and will be remained, and we're gonna keep up with that, we still think that such details are not linked to the history of the property, rather to the man that owned the property. And perhaps the removal, it's not the right approach, but the act of dislocating or repositioning those elements, those frames and those um, ornaments would or be possible, it would be possible to generate another discourse that breaks with the history of a character that because of his position of power could acquire those valuable um, pieces out of context to be part of his dwelling. And we like to imagine such elements as a collection of ornaments that must prevail, but that somehow dare to resignify a new discourse around them. And we're still in the process of like presenting these ideas and I'm sure they're not going to be approved by the institutions because <laughs> um, they are of value and they have to remain as they are on where they are. Um, but we're still like, I thought Valeria was gonna be here. So I was ending this for her. <laughs> and <laughs> online, perfect. So we'll discuss this um, with questions afterwards. So the moving forward with the next, with the third project, 
um, using Palazzo della Regione as an example, Rossi mentions that a complex building develops not only in the spatial di dimension, but also in the temporal dimension as part of the collective memory of a city. And when we talk about the typology in Mexico and pretty much everywhere in the world, we know the typology of the patio, the central courtyard. And in Mexico City, we, we can discuss not just one building, but a series of buildings over time that are both engraved in the collective memory of the city or even the country. In this um, plan, what we can see is the urban trace in the city of such typology. These two images show through different representations how um, like the relationship towards the solid and the open spaces as a courtyard. The, behind the Zócalo, uh, the main plaza in Mexico City and the main cathedral in maybe Latin America, the site in red, it's, it's, the, it's an old 19th century building, once home of the photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo, then residence to, of priests, and now a boutique hotel by Grupo Habita. The building stands out because of the typology of the central path. And how we ought to incorporate different momentums from the pre-Hispanic to the religious and to the colonial. In addition to the idea of, of luxury, it mingles around this main voice. Um, the exceptional architecture narrates various, um, various history, like different moments in history through the construction system that shapes the building. However, the, the belief, however, even though we, we acknowledge those valuable moments and what we wanted to rethink or to question was the idea of, of the central courtyard. And with that attempt to withdraw the irrelevant momentous, we focus on the, the notion less is enough, highlighting that luxury today had to do with the relationship to an outer space, to bringing light in, to having like this possibility of, um, um, of natural sources of, uh, of light. So under these principles, we focus on transforming the patio typology, recognizing the multiple qualities that, that the main courtyard offers as a common ground that reproduces the interior space. Uh, in the interior space, similar momentous as it happens in a plaza or in an enclosed square. However, what we pursue here was to how to transform the idea of patio by introducing um, smaller patio at the border of the corridor that surrounds the main, the main patio. And these are the, the small squares that, that appear here. Those are the, that was the challenge or the struggle we had with the institutions in charge at that time, because by, by perforating this structure, we were sort of like um, attacking the idea or the typology of the central court. But at the same time, um, what we aim uh, it wasn't like what we wanted. We had to gather a lot of evidence to provide that the, the, the building was already damaged. It was in detriment. Like we were not um, perforating it that much, even though we kind of were perforating it um, in some points. Um, but it wasn't because we wanted to endeavor uh, or to, to erase the typology, but rather to weave it to an additional extension of smaller courtyards. And that with this, we were reinforcing the benefits of transitioning through patios. So behind these wooden panels and the corridor, the structure is perforated on the three-story building, allowing a void to recreate the connection of a patio and a new relationship to the typology per se. The central, the well, the hotel private life surrounds the central courtyard on the access floor, as if, as if the street enter on the back of the building, all the way to the back of the building. The materiality evokes the, evokes the foundations and constructions that remain as per Hispanic architecture in the subsoils. The black granite in the, in the first level remains in silence to allow a series of other materials to be discovered, discovered during the intervention that took place. Most of the structures were preserved. We tried to be as quiet as possible when bringing new elements or materials. It had to be part of the experience at play with the natural light the refraction of it and the ventilation, letting the patios interrelate with the inside patios or the side patios that were central to the bedrooms and act as filters from the public and private life. 
um, on the corridors of the hotel. So as I mentioned before, the hotel experience is underpinned by the thought, less is enough. Inside the bedrooms, the light bounces of white quarries, elements of vegetation, water, and what is necessary um, within the furniture. Playing here as well with the conventional idea of a room, of, of the rooms of the priest, as well as inspired by the Shakers community. Um, and the, room, the, the rooms and elements in it become part of the game that invites us to reflect on the idea of luxury. The critical exercise was carried out to mediate between preservation within the city, using material from pre-Hispanic um, constructions, while at the same time to mediate the interior and exterior condition. Reflecting on the collective space for a hotel can lead to the existence of an infinite limbo between, be between private property and public space. And at the same time, it contemplates that building with a vision of the future must imply ceasing to conceive the heritage as something static as if it were a relic, and understanding that this careful intervene and preserve relic can modify the memory of those around it, and even to another scale of, the, of its society. And the last project, it's, um, it's something a little bit different in terms of, uh, of relating to heritage. And Rossi suggests that the city can be seen as a set of different architectures and each one of them responds to a, a specific moment in the history of the city. Due to the passage of time, it is usual that some infrastructures that were originally outside the city end up being absorbed by, the, by it and become one of the remnants that manifest the growth and expansion of the city. And industrial space, waste management, land exploitation, agricultural use, among others. Such transformations are part of the urban boundary and it is in daily contact with the city inhabitants. In the municipality of Nacosari de Garcia in Sonora, a series of dams are the result from copper mining. And we were asked to work with La Moctezuma Tailing Dam. And for those of you who are not familiarized with um, the, a tailing dam, the, the tailings are these red marks in this map. And in black is the Nacosari de Garcia town. We're talking about a population of approximately 11,000 people. And um, a dump is the, well, the tailings are the waste of material left uh, once the, the mining, the mineral extracted from an ore is concluded, they leave all these sort of like um, remains. So it's pretty much toxic material and it brings a lot of like problems in terms of pollution, like the exploitation. If I mute here, is the microphone here for the ones online? No, okay. I think they can hear you. Okay, so um, the, okay. the exploitation of the mine ended a century ago. However, the, resi the residue of that process remains at a large scale in this territorial transformation. Already immersed in the town, as you saw in the map, like the town and this tailing dam are pretty close now. Um, and this series of problems related to contamination by erosive process. So the, um, the exploitation of the mine, uh, the, if we return to the idea or to the initial conflict of what happens when a construction collapses, this dilemma can be applied to those infrastructure that had a function outside the city limits, but once they are absorbed, they need a need of change. The tools used as critical conservation or experimental preservation can take actions and reflections even in this um, context this time to the heritage of our environment. If we look at, back at the waste or inert matter that the mining industry results in, from the point of view of architecture, we can understand them as working material to, to, to generate nature-based infrastructure that can be reincorporated into the cycle of life and to avoid them to be left aside as residues um, or remains. If we look at, back to the waste um, or inert, matter that the mining industry produce from the point of view that um, this could be used and um, we should sort of like um, get involved with other disciplines and try to to understand what could be the organic matter to add in this in order to be part of the life and not to leave it as, uh, as something dead as, as, as dead soil. So we've been sort of like doing certain 
um, collaboration with different um, disciplines. And we've pretty much tried to do and um, like to understand how the flow of waters um, works and how, what, what's the minimum thickness of adding organic matter to, to bring life again. So we did like a, through a series of um, hydrological and landscape strategies and um, we, we've been trying to make um, like living matter exist again on these 36 hectares of a tailing in, and bringing this into a cycle mm -hmm. where it's no longer understood as a final residue, but it's as a part of the ecological cycle of an era. And through the notion of rethinking cycles of inhabiting, we could acknowledge not only the matter and materials that constitute a historical heritage, but also the energy, the water, the human labor, the carbon footprint, the economy, and the memory of awareness that we are independent, that we are interdependent of, um, in the world. Those our actions have implications with multiple bodies, and it is essential to recognize that beyond our body and its relationship, we are interconnected with multiple scales. And with this, we can acknowledge our long human existence, because only from the relationship only from this relationship is that we will fully be responsible of the actions um, we develop when we interact, occupate, or re inhabit um, a space. Thank you. I think we have a thank you, thank you, thank you, Aurela. We have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. Any questions from the audience here or anyone online? Um, so the question is what of the projects I seen a uh, under permit review with Ina? How do you struggle with the uh, officers and how do you manage? Um, well, the, like we struggle, as I said before, with like all the people that gets involved in the project. But a specific, uh, talking specifically about institutions, the thing with it is, as I said before, because there aren't any like certainties that could validate sort of like um, some steps, like, like a process, like you can do up to here and then we move on. Like, because everything is stuck on paper and there's no process of like starting with certain certainty that by starting we are going to move forward. Then sometimes it's better not to do things because it puts at risk uh, uh, like the governmental image and the idea of like conservation or how to approach conservation or preservation. And um, it gets to that point where it's very delicate to make the first steps. So in the project of, of the cinematographic product, productora, um, like just recently after three years also of um, having this project under um, different authorities, we just managed to start the construction as you saw in the last um, photo. And it's been incredible to have these conversations with the new team at INA um, on what to preserve, what not to preserve. And we're moving forward right now, like with demolitions, like, and, and that's something where we're up to now. Like we can sort of like eliminate all the elements that are no longer part of like the, the, the history or the relevant elements that need to be conserved. However, when we move forward, um, I was bringing up like this possibility of discussing whether we need to keep like all these um, retablos or these elements that are decoration. And it's not that we are, don't acknowledge the value of them, but they're not part of like the, the design or the momentum of this conventional architecture. And you see it on the thickness of the walls here. And you see it on the, if you access to the combat of the Del Carmen, there are like similarities on the, on the architecture. But here then you see all these additional elements that are not really part of the same momentum. And it's more of like a, 
a position of power where the person that was able to acquire them um, had. And that's sort of like where we question, how do we um, construct a new discourse within what are we preserving and why we preserve the things we preserve? And regarding your clients, how do you manage the, the money and the, the patient regarding all these like the clients here are actors and they are aware of like public impressions and sort of like that the institution needs to sort of like also respond to a series of like events or uh, or or questions by by the public and by the government at, uh, itself so they understand that these things take time but the other clients the first project that i show you they were investors Okay. So they're like, it's a different relationship and they could not wait for all that time. Like they're investing their money and they have that property. And if there aren't any guarantees, there's no way for them to move forward, like just to see how long it takes or how it moves within time. So for them, like time is money and it's different. Like for these clients, it's their project, it's their space where they're going to operate and work and be creative. So that's where like there are, that's where the government lacks of um, certainty. So like, it would be great to say this paper would, would be valued for like six years, no matter if there is any change of government. But the thing is that because rules are still sort of like changing sometimes in a good way, but sometimes on a bad way, like there is no certainty for that. And that's why it's different. Like each client is different. Um, <clears throat> And it's a new relationship with institutions with each project because they're like separate things. I assume that this uh, project that we are looking at the screen um, is in a small community. It's not in Mexico City, right? It's in Mexico City. It's, it's like it is, in, it's in yeah, it's um, San Angel, which is ah, okay. San Angel. historic, yeah. Okay. Because the, I think one of the uh, very unique situations of this project is how close this property is to the church, right? I mean, I, I know, I don't know any other place in Mexico which uh, the backyard of a church is private property, right? Yeah, yeah. like. San, in San Angel, but even in the city center, like this land, that it's a little bit blurry, but like the construction of the city, as I said, it's really layers on top of layers. And this one, like you can see it in red, like even the, the, the new property has the remains of that okay. um, convent. Mm -hmm. And that, that was something that happened a few years ago, it's not recent, right? Most property. Like this ago. old San Francisco oh. convent is from so, the 500s. Yes, yes. The and then, yeah, yeah 16th century. century. Yeah. Yeah. So we have like those, well, not we, the clients have that, they have the remains of those walls um, and they used to be covered. Yeah. Like when we found the, the, this article project, the, those walls were covered, covered mm -hmm. in, in cardboard walls. Yeah. And when we uncovered them, it was like, they should be remained, like they should be part of like um, the elements that tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. And not to, to remake them or to, yeah. to, to do them as new, but just like to remain them as they are in their natural state. And with that, to dialogue with like the different momentums. At least that, that's the way we approach to this um, heritage in the, in the office. Now, in the context of that, of the church, <clears throat> where does the property in, uh, at the wall of the church or uh, inside? Is the church also private? No, no. In San Angel. All the, all the, all the <laughs> churches are public. Are public, are public, yeah, public property. property. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? So, because I think one of the scenarios that I was explaining here is how Mexico's uh, heritage is kind of complex to maintain because all the church properties belong to the state. Right? 
and and it's a model that does not works in here at all. Yeah, and the thing here with like institutions is that it's a lot about like the team that make up these institutions. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in the second project, like this was in the previous um, administration. administration, but in today's administration, we managed to move forward with with the other with this project, yeah. which had it had been sitting there to be sort of like approved and to mm -hmm. move forward for like three years. And we were saying yesterday that it's very hard sometimes to get the institutions to, to say yes or no. They don't have probably the team to make sure that they can set them up, supervise what they're proposing. So it's hard for them to say yes or no. So it just takes forever. Yes, and it's not really about the people that are inside the institution, but the structure of the institution. Mm -hmm. That um, it is like a super complex condition, especially in a city that has all these layers of history like how do you really deal with with what's behind this mm -hmm. and like there there isn't really any there can be regulations that said these are the steps the steps to follow up because every project is different every project has and that's sort of like um lack of regulation or lack of steps it's also an opportunity mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that it should be the other way or it just says it, it's just the way it is and it's it's where the philosophical questions arise and that's where we can sort of like be critical and suggest something different because otherwise it would be as carlos was suggesting like keep the facade keep this keep that and and every sort of like um existence should be addressed with the right questions and there cannot be a guideline guideline for all of the monuments and and projects that are in the city which very much lines up with yesterday's uh, answer from Valeria that you know every single case is different, right? And they have to be addressed individually. Okay, so uh, thank you again, Gabriela, for answering the presentation. Very happy together. Um, we are going to take a, a ten-minute break and resume at twelve forty. So those of you who are uh, at home, please uh, hang tight. We are going to be back at 12.40. And uh, those of you here, if you need to do something else in the next 10 minutes, please do so. And see you back in uh, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Listo para pues compartirlo con yeah, el drop. El drop. ¿Cuál es? ¿Estás en línea? No, pero no importa. Debe de. Ahorita te da. Eh, permite si está público. Pero vamos a grabar, ¿no? Ahí está donde está. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahí está. Ahí está, espero que un iPhone. O es que tendría que aparecer la No,
Okay, so we are gonna we are going to resume a, the conversation here. For those of you who are just connecting to a Zoom, welcome. And for those of you who are have been here for a while, thank you for sticking around. Uh, we are going to continue with the next presentation. Uh, so I'm going to ask Pancho to Francisco Pardo uh, to uh, briefly introduce himself and then continue with uh, his presentation. Let's see. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, I guess we have a lot of people online. Let me know if you cannot hear on the back. Um, so, I guess you all heard um, a little introduction about Mexico City, but Either way, I'd like to start by um, saying that uh, I work in this city. My practice has been here for the last 20 years. Um, and I've been working in, um, in several projects in the city mainly. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, regeneration of buildings and uh, retrofitting of buildings. Um, city that is highly complex, one of the most complex cities for engineering and for um, uh, working in the, in the tectonics of the valley. Uh, it's, a, it's an old lake. Um, the Aztecs established here uh, barely 700, 800 years ago. It's probably one of the oldest centers in all the continent in America. Um, so it's rich of culture, and as Gabi was saying, it's a city of layers, but it's not a, it's not a metaphor, it's actually literal. The, the, the way the city was built was on top of a lake, on a meseta or an, on a valley, and it has a different cities on top of each other. So this, this, these murals by Diego Rivera show the, 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 the close connection between the city and the lake and the valley and the volcanoes. It's in the volcanic rim of Mexico, so it's a, it's a complex situation because um, uh, not, only, not only we have water underneath, but we have high seismic uh, pressure. So it, it sinks and it moves. <laughs> so, so with that, we have to build on top of that. Uh, so these are uh, fantastic images from, um, from, from ICA, from uh, when they had a company called Aerofoto. Uh, they have fantastic photos of the, of, the, um, of the city. And the city is a big uh, um, sprawl um, covering this lake, practically becoming like a carpet on top of, on top of the water. Um, of course, it has infrastructure, it has, it has limits, it has uh, different conditions, but it's also a city that looks a lot to the outside or to the void space, and the void space becomes the, the, the real use space, not so much as the inside. So the markets are a cultural thing since the Aztecs in the plazas, and it becomes a, a, a way of like, like um, um, uh, transforming to the outside, to the, to the outside, the, 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 the programs. So the city literally, as I was saying, it just builds up on, on top of this. Under this concrete carpet, there's an old ancient city that is the Aztec city. And then on top of this, it's a 300, uh, colonial, a 300 year old colonial city. Then over on top of this is a, a neoclassical city, then the modern city. And now it's a contemporary city building on top of this. So we build layers. And it's very important to mention that each layer has a time and has a moment. So we cannot do what they did or what someone else did. We have to do a new architecture on top of the old architecture. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's one is better than the other. It's just a matter of, of layering up uh, a condition. So the city grows. And this is the other problem, problem that the city has, that it also uh, not only builds up, but it builds down. 
uh, and the deconstruction of the city happens through uh, systemic uh, earthquakes every uh, 30 to 50 years in a, in a cycle. And this, um, uh, of course, without talking about the destruction and the horrible part of it, it, it brings another layer of complexity to the city that has to do with, with, this, with this idea of deconstructing the city. Um, so at the end, this series of pictures that I'm going to show now are a, a few blocks away. And you will see the, the complexity also in typology uh, the, the different typologies that happen in, in the same areas. This is just a few blocks away, and you can see here all the different layers from Art Deco to uh, neo-colonial architecture to contemporary architecture um, uh, to French architecture. And it's, it's a simple uh, way of understanding the city. This is, this is a city that is very rich on uh, its eclecticism, um, and it just goes on forever, you know, the whole city uh, condition of eclecticism. Um, so by saying that, then I go to the part that I'm more interested in when I, when I work in projects uh, that has had to do with uh, retrofitting. Um, uh, the prosthetics or prosthetic uh, idea that doctors use to um, uh, design technology so that uh, whenever a part is missing, you can actually bring a new part, right? Like a, like a leg or a hand, if you lose the, the original part, then you have a spare part. A spare part could be a high-tech part that has to do with um, uh, doing retrofitting of the body, and then uh, or you can have a new bone made of uh, different materials. And it doesn't mean that it has to be the same material. It means that it it could be a different material that actually outperforms the, 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 the original one. It's much better, it's harder, it's, it's lighter, or it's, or it's, um, or it's uh, uh, you can bend it better. Uh, so this is, this is the way that I don't like to use prosthetics. This is the way that I think it's not right to use prosthetics in architecture. Uh, this is the way of uh, mimicking an old, um, an old architecture with the new technologies that we have. Uh, I am much more interested in this kind of prosthetics that have to do with the new technologies of iron uh, uh, con controlling or, or, or grabbing these columns so that it doesn't explode or implode. And I, I, I am way more interested in this kind, uh, kind of conditions of prosthetics. This is Bernal Schumi's uh, curatorship and Museum of Athens. And this is the placement of each piece from the front part of the, of the Acropolis, um, uh, the upper part of the, the frieze, or uh, I don't know how they call it in English, but, but then the, the setting of the parts that were found without having to build the ones that are not there. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not that the lack of the other parts is not important, it's just that the space is it's there for them to be there in, in essence. Uh, so the, 3D composition, it's, it's the original, but the, the old pieces are not uh, rebuilt or redone uh, after they are gone. So prosthetics are like this. It's this, 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 um, this uh, technology could outperform the, the older technology or, or the older condition uh, to do things that are actually better uh, or faster. Or you can actually change the program of that, of that uh, original piece to a new condition. So by understanding that, then I go, uh, I'm, I'm gonna present uh, a couple of projects that were competitions and three projects that, are, that were built. This is, this is the first time that I had to, to work with um, retrofitting of a building. I, thought after graduating school that I was going to build uh, buildings like, like what I thought architectural, what architecture was, that you come and there's, there was a site, there's a site with four uh, flags uh, uh, in each corner, and then you came and the site was clean, and then you build this fantastic piece of architecture. <laughs> and, then, and then I realized that with this project, uh, after trying to do that other thing that I was talking about, this, this, this new fantastic museum with shiny materials, and then 
with, with this competition I, uh, in the office, we have to face that mm -hmm. that we didn't know, the unknown of, of working with a, with a pre-existence. Uh, this is a project that we won, and it was an important project. It never got built because of political reasons, but we even did the, 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 the whole CDs and, and, and follow through of the project. This is an old um, prison in Mexico built in the 19th century, panoptic style, um, uh, like Michel's Foucault panoptic. So the guard in the middle could see all the cells at the same time. Um, there's, there's few in Mexico in the whole country. This is the only one in Mexico City. It's a fantastic piece. Um, and uh, when it was a prison, it worked. Uh, each one of these um, arms is, is one area of the cells. Then the two round pieces on the back are the cells for uh, dangerous criminals. Um, and the center is a panoptic view area. Uh, these are the old pictures of, of what it looked like when it got um, a packed in a, in a way and decay, the government changed the program to uh, fit the National Archives. Um, so this is a transformation in the, in the 70s. Uh, the National Archives became the place where you uh, uh, have all the important documents of the country, but, but the, the condition of the lake didn't help. The buildings were sinking, uh, water was entering the walls and the documents got decayed. So then they hired a, an architect to do a new archive a building, um, a contemporary building uh, that held the, so they didn't know what to do with this building. So this building proposed a new idea, a, cent a cultural center uh, for the city. So we did um, three basic techniques that are that are understanding the materiality of the cells. This is the this is this first picture on the on the, on the upper left side is is the the way they built uh, this building. It was precast and 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 um, panels of of metal also in between the cells. So we decided that that was a way a way of understanding how we can take things out, uh, understanding the the technology used in the nineteenth century, and then. The, the lower uh, right picture, it's a, it's a picture that I really like because the inmates uh, used to have a free Sunday inside this, the, the prison. So families came over. So they, they did these fairs inside so that children of the, uh, of the inmates could play and be part of like a, like a Sunday in the plaza kind of condition, like a Sunday in the park with their kids. So I think this is fantastic because it was really used as a public space, let's call it, in, inside this non-public um, situation. Uh, the building, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into, into details, but the red part is the one that we, uh, um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the new add-on, the, the, the piece that we add to the original structure. And at the end, it's just a, a, a new piece at the center that connects all of these uh, arms, and, and, and it's about the way you circulate the, the whole building. Um, a very complex program from libraries, from kids' areas, from parks. Um, uh, the whole gray area here, uh, the white is the original, and the gray area is the, the, the part that, we're, that, that, we, that we were uh, intervening. Uh, this is the old uh, um, dangerous criminal cells uh, that, that they turned the walls long after, long before we came in. So we decided to turn into a, like a botanical garden. And then I'm, I'm gonna move to a project that we did uh, with Urbano, here Rodrigo present. Um, it's probably the first project that we uh, built and probably uh, the first building that was done as a retrofitting in this neighborhood in the last 30 years. Uh, you, you, or, won, you won the competition of Bucarelli. It was yes. the first prize. Yes. Said. yes, we did. Yes. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have to say, even though he's here, fantastic client. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Uh, not only as a client, as an architect, and also as understanding the city and understanding the needs of the city. And I think we uh, were friends very long before, and we understood uh, both um, both offices uh, the challenges. I don't think we even discuss or in in a, in, a, in in two different paths as client or developer or architect or designer. We always felt we were in the same boat uh, together. So. This is, this is a site. This is the original building. The original building um, uh, is fantastic. And it had this kind of scale of a single family house, but it wasn't a single family house. And that was, that, that, that was a very uh, interesting typology for those times that it was um, um, a place where there were four apartments together in, uh, in, the, in that building, but it was in the middle of a high-end single family house um, uh, neighborhood. So the first thing to, to understand is what is it made of? What's, what's inside our guts? Um, and by doing that, then you understand what you can do after. Um, in the, I, I have to say that I presented that competition, not because it's important now, it was, 10 years ago, but it, it was the first time uh, we had to design a set of rules. And then we apply those rules here and we added those with, the, with Urbano also in a think tank. Uh, the, 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 the rules that are important for us and I keep them with me through these whole 10 years of doing uh, projects like this is, the first rule is you never build you never build anything that is already unbuilt. I mean, you don't do fake stories. You don't do anything fake. There's no worst um, architecture than the fake one. And the fake one is a 21st century building that tries to resemble a 19th century building. That's probably the most awful condition in architecture and is degrading for the, pro for the profession. Second rule is, um, I forgot the second rule. I will remember this <laughs> comment. <laughs> so, so what do you mean with that? If you're going to refurbish uh, an existing building and something has collapsed, you will never put it back the way it was, or you will never try to create a second. Uh, right. You, you don't do fake, fake historics. Okay. If there's a molding and um, there's a piece of the building that fell down, you don't rebuild it the, in the technology of the 19th century. Unless you rebuild it with the technology of the next century. No. You don't rebuild it with today's technology faking it. Exactly. You have to have the new architecture becoming the new architecture. The new architecture has to be from the 21st century. It cannot be from the last, from the 19th century. So this is a cut we did in the building. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a section through the building and we left it as it is. It's a beautiful facade on the back of the building. Uh, we, we cut it because it was damaged by structure. The, 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 the blocks in the city, in Mexico City, because of the, uh, of the water, uh, they tend to bend towards the inside of the block, to the center of the block. So always the last parts of the, of the structures, the back parts of the structures are the most damaged um, because of this condition. So this is the, the end part. So we cut it like, like a sashimi uh, piece. So you could see like the, the elements, all the elements. Um, whatever is in black is the original walls. Uh, everything else is the new, the new condition. Let me show you the section. I think that's more. So here, uh, I don't know, the, the contrast is not very good, but you can see that there's a, a, a darker gray that's the new and the black is the, is the original house. I mean, those, these two floors are the original house and then the new condition is the is the is the piece the new piece here is here is clear so see there's the house the restoration happens of course there's painting that's clean up of the of the facades there's new arrangements but we didn't we didn't build the the density that we were trying to do of course institutions wanted us to do that they wanted us to copy the second floor and do the third floor with that typology. And we said, no, we said, no, 
uh, we said no, and then actually it happened. It happened in a very interesting way that we actually, I think we, we ended up changing a lot of minds, no, Rodrigo, with this project. I think we did. I think we did, and we were happy about that. Um, the back tower. So here, here's what I'm saying. That building on the back, the white one, it's a 70s building that is our neighbor, right? And then you have this uh, 19th, 20th century building, early 20th century building that is the red. And then you have this other piece that is these prost prosthetics that, are, that, 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 that could work uh, as a prosthetic, that is the, the new way of entering or circulating, that it's a piece that attaches to it, but it's not the same technology. It's like, like the prosthetics, you cannot uh, make it uh, by organic means, uh, the skin of the original piece, but then you have other techniques or other technologies to do it. And then it's clear that it's clear where you touch, it's clear how you do it, it's clear how you articulate both, and they never compete. They actually work in a, in a, in a two system that, that one enriches the other one. Parking lot. Um, and the and the way it's um, it's arranged the apartments inside. It was a very a very simple solution, not easy, very complex uh, to be able to build in this, but a, a simple solution. So so here is here is where when you see all this mix of of typologies. Um, this is the rooftop with the two floors on top of this. Then you have on the like on the Far view, you have a 60s building or 50s, and then you have the early 20th century building, and everything it works together. So, so what, when I'm talking about the eclecticism in the city, you have a um, 20th century building next to a 16th century building in a flat horizontal way. So, I always wonder why if you turn it 90 degrees. Uh, so the 19th century, the 16th century building is here, and on top of that is a 21st century building. It's the same condition. You're just turning it 60, uh, 90 degrees. But the the um, authorities doesn't understand this because each each plot is supposed to be a new world and it's supposed to be a different universe. But in the eyes of the of the scale of a city, it doesn't work like that. The whole city becomes a, a scape. So this is the way you you. Um, uh, you understand like these, these layers that I'm cutting are uh, bringing pieces, then you make sure that you see that cut and you see how you attach the new piece and you keep the memory of the old one. Of course, the relationship between the public space, this, uh, 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 it would be nice to talk about the whole experience of how when you, um, uh, do retrofitting of a piece like this, then you can actually, with that very simple uh, measurements or me very simple steps, you can actually change a condition of a whole block and then a condition of a series of blocks and even a condition of a, of a neighborhood. Um, the density above. And then, after this success story, the uh, the building next door, the ne ne next door that it was a, a single family house, but acquired by by Urbano again, and they asked us to to propose something that could work in the same um, in the same way with um, with uh, with the building next door. But it was a different typology. This is a real single family house, so. The, the system of the structure is, is different because uh, the living rooms were big, uh, dining rooms were big, the rooms were not modulated in the same great configuration, so it was harder. So we, we decided first to do um, a, a structure that could go outside of the facade, do not touch the building and be kind of like something that carries itself up and, and, and carries the, the, the density above. Uh, we did this first, then we changed it. Uh, uh, talking to a lot of engineers, it was better to have the house below being the bearing walls of the piece above. A lot of studies of form, form that is not just because of the form, it had to do with the light 
with the south blocking our own project next to it so it was like doing harakiri to our own project so we had to open these these cuts uh, so that light sunlight came through the through, uh, to the apartments so in this diagram you see uh, the the context then in in medium gray you see the original two buildings and then in light gray you see the new proposal or the new density that we're adding to this so you have the uh, in dark uh, the, the, the old house then the new the new pieces here also the relationship with the um, with the other place that i showed the, the, the way it might connect here at the entrance and you have a, a, a kind of a plaza that is working uh, as an hybrid con, uh, condition and the new structure and the density you see this section, you see the density of the space. Practically, you, you're building like everything you can um, as, a, as a quality of, of, of as a contemporary city. That, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rule that we decided we're, together with Robert Rubano that not only we're doing these re restorations and these renovations and also these ad subs, but we're going to work with the maximum density that the, that the code allowed us. And this is to bring more square meters to the center of the city that needs it so bad. Again, the two pieces working together. And all the complex of the different buildings working into one. So if you see this, this uh, on the back of this uh, space, there are uh, concrete walls. Those are angle, angle walls that come all the way from the foundation, all the way up, and they carry the new program on top. So we have to cut these uh, cutouts in the corners to put this uh, companion wall next to the original wall so that it grabs the original wall. So it's kind of like a scaffolding that is grabbing it, grabbing the building, existing building, uh, and then carrying the, the top building. You see there's, there's a column uh, wall on the back of this also that cuts through the molding, uh, cuts the molding right like a, like a very subtle cut of a, of a surgeon, and then it just goes up. Here is the same as an angle. So this is this is the facade of the of the two projects working together and doing uh, a, a new intervention in the block, and it did change the condition of this street and then of the of the other blocks at the same time. And then this is another project that that is done also with Urbano in in collaboration with them, and it's a very interesting project because this is not the typical um, preservation idea of a building because for the authorities it doesn't have a value but for us it had a value and the value it's also interesting interesting to to conserve and the value of this is that it was um typology that happened in in uh, in mexico in this area of mexico city because the earthquake in 85 um, was really harsh with this area with these blocks um, 20 to 30 percent of the buildings got damaged, um, and then there were a lot of empty lots. And people left this area uh, as a residential area, and they flee because of uh, they were scared of this area. So it became a commercial, mainly in the industry, in the industry of uh, out of parts selling. Uh, so this is a this is a a, 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 a well store for auto parts. The lower part was where the sale happened. Then the second uh, floor was the sales department, like accountants and the sales. And then on top was the closed warehouse with all the boxes. So you order below and then they bring this box and then you get your auto part. Um, 
we love the structure because it was a perfect grid, probably not built by architects, by a, a, an engineer that was very um, uh, rectilinear doing this grid. And we thought it was fantastic. So, so why would we, why would uh, uh, Rurbano ask us to keep this structure? Uh, it, it's, it's not only for financial reasons, it, it, it also has to do with sustainability. It's way more sustainable to keep a structure and, re, and, and do retrofitting than to tear it down and do the most sustainable building. So you see what I mean? It's way more sustainable. The amount of energy to destroy this and then to reveal something, even if it's with the best technology of sustainability, is not worth it. So we, we, uh, we took together, we started doing exhibitions, happenings in the place, just to kind of feel what people were saying about this space and get ideas. Um, at the end, what we decided to do is a multifunction building that could work as a market, as a venue, as a local place to buy food or to buy um, uh, goods. This is, a, this is a structure. If you strip down the facades and the, and the elements that are not important to carry itself, this is the main, the main skeleton. Add-ons, stairs, uh, a pergola on the top. The way it works. So, it's the context. So then you have this piece, and then if you strip it, you have this piece that it's more transparent. It has to do with permission to the lower, to the to the street level, uh, and then that that way of getting in that it's always open. Then you can uh, go through the building as an open structure. And this is what we were aiming to, to have a real connection with the interior to the exterior. So um, a lot of things have, have happened there. It has changed uh, uh, restaurants, it has changed a lot, but it's a very dy dynamic uh, building that could work as anything. It's, the, it's, it's what Ms. Van der Rohe used to say, the universal space. The same space can be used as, a, there's, not, there's no such thing as a typology anymore after, after those high rises that, a space could be an apartment, could be a church, could be, it depends on the activity. It's also what Bernard Schumann calls the action. And the action happens not in this class, but it happens in the hallway. And the hallway is a very important part of that action to happen. And then the program is decided by whoever programs. So at the end, um, it was a local venue. It's a, it's a, I, I didn't talk about, a lot about this neighborhood, but it's in between two different crowds or two different uh, uh, breeds. One are the is the financial district and the other one is the hip artist community. On the, so, so when you bring these two together, it's like uh, water and oil. Uh, and actually, this, I think these kind of venues work for both. So this is what happens in, in the inside. and the relationship with the other buildings. And then I'm gonna present two projects that one of them is on their way, takes forever. Uh, and the other one is a lost competition. And it's, it's a work we're doing with the city, uh, with, this, with the metro system. And uh, uh, the first, uh, different to other subways in the world, the, the, the first three lines that were the first ones done in Mexico City in 67, 68 for the Olympics, uh, those first um, uh, lines, uh, the city owned property on top of the city and that property became voids. And until now, those spaces are voids. It's only the, uh, the, the, um, um, the exit door of the subway, but it's a, it's a, private, it's a property on in the block. So what the city asked us is we presented this project um, is to densify all those spaces and become infrastructure. So we counted. It was millions of square meters that were lost as airspace for the subway system. And the subway system is broke. 
and it's subsidized. So we said, have those millions of square meters, build them and rent them. Uh, and when you rent them, then the, then the um, money becomes from rents and not so much from the subway system tickets that are subsidized. Is that a, ah, somebody entered. So that's the, that's the structure. So they had to buy this land from the city or seize this land from, 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 from uh, privates to be able to build the exits of the, of the subway. So then they became voids in the city. And if you sum all that up, it's a lot of airspace that is wasted. So we said, okay, your infrastructure is what is important for the subway to work. But then you have all this other mass on top that you can actually develop. So of course we understood every single part of the subway system, how it works and how, this, how the structure runs. And then on top is this new uh, mass. So we plan, we, our idea in program is commercial. It's also housing, housing that could be rent. Um, there's some programs uh, in the world that uh, social housing can be, and it works the model that it could be made up for rent. So when you change jobs, you can actually change apartment and you don't have to live in the same house in the outskirts of the city and then you know, you can actually move around the city. You live on top of a subway, that, that's very convenient. So this is the idea of, of filling the void, let's call it. Of course, it has to do with renovation of the, of the, of the subway system or the stations. And this is a section, see, see how these, these are empty lots that are a kind of like little markets, um, uh, not, not regulated. And, and this is a new proposal of, of filling up the voids. And then the other one is a much more uh, risky one because it's, this, this is not happening. That is on top of, a, of an existing um, market. That's the market, that's, that's the mass that exists now. And it blocks one, two, great, two big avenues and it blocks uh, uh, in this way. So they used to have a more permeated system on the, on the first floor, have a market, have a, a, a rooftop or a, or a public park that actually could connect to the subway system. So then instead of going out to the street, you go out or into the subway through this public park and then have the capi capitalistic view. You have this mass of buildings that could be leased by the government to different institutions and get money back for rents. That's the park, that's the, like the, the lobby entrance for the buildings and then the section on the mass. So there's also another way of understanding a different scale that has to do with this infrastructural systems of the city that could actually be part of this big idea of retrofitting, retrofitting not only a building, but the city, the infrastructure and the system. The one on the right is an original building that it's not used in the inside. And that's about it of this and then then this is another competition that we uh, turned in and we got second place, we didn't win it, but the, the main idea is very simple. Also with, um, with commercial areas that are problematic in the city, the idea of the, 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 there's always this thing, it happens with my students a lot, uh, you give them a site and they work only in the inside of the site. And they never think of the connection with the street or the connection with the other block and what's going on. So what we did here is we say, okay, we're gonna work on the market that that's the center great piece. But by working on the market, you have to work on everything that actually connects to this, the subway system, the bus system, the streets, the, the, the uh, biking system. So it's, it's about permeating horizontally to the whole Merced uh, site. Uh, different typologies for play, from, for shop, for commuting, for moving. And at the end, we, we, we turn uh, in this one board. That is all the typologies that could happen here 
and all the actions that could happen in a long section. So you have from the plaza of the of the constitution that that's the the, the center part where the cathedral and the and the uh, presidential office is to this whole section of connecting this neighborhood that is central to this other neighborhood that is that has this big wall in the middle that al doesn't allow this to permeate to this. By doing that, we ended up having a, 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 a urban a momentum of, of connecting and of, of working on buildings. And then you have the opportunities of retrofitting each one of these typologies in a more close uh, surgery way. Well, thank you very much. Excellent, uh, Francisco. Thank you Let, very much. For should I stop the share? No. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave have, it to you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions or comments. The subway system projects. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this, you said that the neighborhood was the boundaries. So I was wondering, did this building um, help the activation of the neighborhood, or they were already uh, conditions that uh, kind of determined the, the success of? It would be really hard to explain that because it not only it, only, it not only activated it hyperactivated the, the no Rodrigo it had hyperactivated. There's some social conditions on the outside, and that corner became really important in the whole neighborhood because it's kind of like a, 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 a thing that happened with people that were living squatters in a in a building and then they went out and they attached to that building like to that corner like a protection uh so it hyper happened you know in a way um i think that is that that not only is the the way you treat the building the important is how you activate it and the activation is the most important part it's not only as uh, to do beautiful architecture i, I don't believe in that i believe that architecture is also the activation of it because then it just becomes a beautiful piece and that's it and for me that's very boring beautiful pieces are very boring for me I, I like beautifulness but it has to do with the activation of the program of the city of the layers of the social texture it, it, it's it's more more than that sure uh, telephone mm -hmm. So did you just achieve your goals or you went beyond that? With that, with that um, it's hard to say, no, Rodrigo, help me on this one because that's that's a very uh, controversial thing. The, the whole social thing that happens in the street now and that, do you have that? Is yeah, that the, sure you yeah. Did you plan it? That's my question. No, you did no not see it happens. Uh, no? It's a political so complex you, thing. Beyond your goals in the, in the street. Yeah. Let, let me show you how to do it. Almost like the thing with the with the uh, with that building is that it was empty. Uh -huh. Then we refurbished it, and everything was going pretty well. And uh, the museum of chocolate is across the street. There's a oh. school across the street. There's a lot of things that happen across the street. So then, people who are living in that uh, there was cars and uh, all property. They were taking out the property, and now they're living in on the street. Uh -huh. So they live on the street, so everything is very 
complicated for for the commercial spaces. They're pretty much empty now. Uh, it's a very tense situation to own the property mm -hmm. around because of the sort of chocolate house. So it's getting to a point where it's not uh, it's actually not healthy. Uh, the relationship so it's damaging the area it's damaging the neighborhood it's damaging the property so it's so complicated get closer so the people on zoom can actually there was a question behind there yeah young man we have we have let me we have one question from from internet uh, from zoom uh, steve actually asked uh, after uh, gabriel's presentation uh, she he he asked uh, thank you for the presentation and i think this is a question that i will open all the panelists from today and yesterday uh, can you talk about the research that goes into the project for for example finding the drawings or order or other representation of the projects uh, are they well documented how does the process go and what role does the architect play as a researcher? That's for Gabby. <laughs> but if you, whomever wants to answer needs to get closer here so people can, can uh, hear you. On, that was for you, you, Gabriela. No, oh, it was after Gabriela's presentation. That's why I'm ah. saying I'm opening up to anyone. No, I think, I think it's fundamental, the research uh, part, the uh, uh, documents. Some buildings are very well documented, I have to say. Uh, most of the buildings in the country are not documented at all, okay? Yeah. There's a lack of documentation that exists in that country that has so much culture that it's overwhelming. But in Mexico City, there's a lot of documentation. I have to say that important buildings are very well documented and the research is part, part of it. But, but that's, that's where I will stop because architects are not a history researchers. Mm -hmm. we, we, uh, architects are a, a breed that actually knows very little about a lot of things. Uh, that's what we do. So we are not experts in one thing. We tend to orchestrate a lot of different ideas and the research is part of it. Um, but we have to get help by historians, by researchers, so on, to make a good work as the same as you work with a structural engineer to work on the foundation and to work on all the different things. But um, uh, it doesn't stop there. Then it's, what is the new condition of the society that lives around there? A church is not the same now than what it meant 18, in the 18th century. And for me, that is, that is very important. A church can be a parking lot and can be a nightclub now. Uh, in Veracruz, there's one that is very famous that it got converted to a parking lot and it's beautiful. Um, uh, so at the end, the documentation is something that is there. It's, it's to help you work. But um, I think what authorities around the world, in Europe is very understandable. I mean, the projects in Europe for retrofitting are fantastic. The US more or less is getting there. Mexico is not there. Uh, we tend to think that that programs and typologies freeze over time. So a, 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 a program that worked in the 17th century has to work the same way now. And it's not like that. Because then we're going to end up with, with ruins and with buildings that work. Wonderful. Anyone else wants to talk about the role of the architect as a researcher? Yeah, everybody wants to hear that. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know Gabriela why. Wants to hear what Gabriela has said. Um, like I do agree with with Pancho about um, the fact that architects are no little, but I also think that um, we have to reduce that gap of like practicing and researching, and how we merge like um, research with the practice, and how we also give place for that research to become part of the practice, like for that research to be a different form of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think even through um, Urbanos exhibitions and, and Pancho showed like a very brief exhibition and it was about um, consequences for my- Oh, life. really? That, yeah, that, I um, remember that. Right. Um, consequences, but um, there was, was a productora, thing. you guys? Yeah, that yeah. was- Three. Um, 
But the thing there yeah, is like, that. even though that exhibition per se was not um, like a robust research, it is also a way to sort of like describe, talk, or address other issues that through architecture, like through the one-to-one -one field architecture, we're not always able to confront or to, or to present. And like, I would suggest that for those architects that are interested in research, like to, to dive into that, but also to get close to offices that have a practical um, approach to complement, because the, the fact that research remains, remains in libraries, in books, and, and they don't merge, it's, um, that's where we're, we're like creating like a huge gap with it. Thank you, thank you, Gabriela. <laughs> so, yeah. Also, sometimes uh, I think that we as an architect, we need, we need, I mean, we, we live in a world of architects and we, we don't look for like people who are specialized in some kind of thing. So one way or another, I think that we as an architect, we have some limits because we have like a super specific profile. And it's important to start to look for another like kind of specialist to help us out to like go deeper in this kind of research. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important to try to open like a uh, spectrum of who collaborate with us. We usually talk about um, uh, about in, in surrounded by architects, and I think that we need to try to push forward the idea of how to create like more multidisciplinary like a uh, way to see how we approach projects. So I, I think it's important, but I think it's also important to try to have like different profiles within the project in order to go deeper and take seriously all this research. Otherwise I think it gets like very superficial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the role of the work of the preservation is, is definitely multidisciplinary, right? Yeah. And everyone is going to do different things. One, one thing that I think um, was not addressed and we should all keep in mind is preservation versus sustainability and density and ecology, you know, the, the, the uh, the the consequences, the ecological consequences of preserving uh, some of the, our projects, and I think if 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 we put that into the equation, maybe the results will be different, uh, and it has to do with with density, you know, and maybe the Manuel Dublan uh, is a good example of that you know if you have such a you know, a, 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 a piece of land with so much infrastructure, uh, subway, transportation, parks around, more people need to live in there so that you don't, you know, so that you don't have sprawl and then you don't need to. So, so I think, um, and, and that's why, for example, places like China, the idea of preservation is very different. And it has to do with other, the, the preservation uh, discipline is a, is a very recent, discipline. And, and, and I think some of the definitions should be challenged for the next century in terms of, okay, it's, mm -hmm. it, what is the price of preserving certain things in terms of the ecological consequences of that? Mm -hmm. uh, it was not, you know, we all know the Torre Latinoamericana in Mexico. That was a super modern building built in the 50s. Mm -hmm. That would not be possible now. No. And now it's part of our landscape, exactly. you know? So, so if you take out more of not just the aesthetics, of, but just the ecological consequences, I think the discipline should evaluate that uh, in, in, the, in the years to follow. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's why we are having this conversation here and presenting all these projects, because I think the philosophy that you guys, Rio Urbano has had over time is showing a different way of different things, right? Of, so show a different way of doing things, right? Of doing projects or addressing the city. But uh, Pancho was saying, uh, I think it's really important is not only uh, addressing from the limits of the building to the inside, but also what happens towards the outside, right? Urban fabric. And I'm very, um, 
triggered and um, stimulated by this idea of layers that you have been, all of you have presented in common. I think it is uh, very interesting to see how uh, you read, your reading of the city has to do with this understanding of multiple layers. And I think it is, is a natural for Mexico City, right? It's not something that is um, um, happening much here, for instance. So it's definitely an instance where Valeria was talking about yesterday, where case by case, well, we have international laws for preservation, but Mexico City is way, way too different to Philadelphia, right? And the way it grew, it has developed over time, definitely has to be looked at as a way to understand what the next steps for, for the city are. And in the historic context, I don't think that's a difference. Right? Excellent. All right, guys. So I think that uh, there are no more questions here. And uh, you guys have done an excellent job. Uh, do you want to show that video? Uh, sure. I mean, one of the things that we've been trying hard from the Rubano is to actually making things happen. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not only about doing the projects, but making sure that we, that we actually build them and deliver them. So this is an image of the last street. You can see the squatter settlements at the end of the street. So the street is close to the public. No one can actually walk through. It's very harsh. Our commercial spaces are empty. People don't want to be there. People don't want to go there because it's a squatter street. And they've been living there for the last uh, almost four. I was gonna say three years, but now we have it's years? four years. Four years? Four, four years. years of people living on the four street. The so it's just, I mean, we own the property uh, to the left of that. And then there's a church and there's our neighbors also have a property. And, and we all say, we cannot handle this anymore. And, and we just had the people dependents move out of our property. So the property <laughs> is basically like abandoned again. Hmm. Even mm. though we had you, that, you did the even though we did everything for it to become a beautiful building, because it is, a, I mean, this again, it's one of the, the projects that I feel most uh, proud of because it wasn't so obvious of, of uh, restoration or, or uh, something that we worked hard on, and, and now it's it's basically bankrupt. And in terms of what the business means, it's basically bankrupt. I mean, we're the value of the property is half of the value of supposed to be. So it's it's impossible to deal with that. And the amount of energy that we put into making sure that things happen, at the end, it's not worth doing it or trying it, at least not in the same way, or I don't know. That's something after 10, 12 years of working in Mexico City, it's something that we're personally evaluating mm -hmm. because we like things to be done. I mean, we like doing things and, and that's what we're actually working on. And we're proud of work with all you guys and happy that you're here and, and very thankful for, for all your time and, and making the effort to come. Yeah, well, if you want to come over here, I think that, yeah, Rodrigo, as I mentioned, has been instrumental in the, in the preparation and uh, having, making possible the, the, this uh, meeting, this symposium. We have had an excellent turnout uh, in terms of our speakers and people who are attending. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, these videos uh, that we have been making are uh, going to be available on Zoom and website and YouTube of the, of the School of Architecture. Diana, you have a question? You raised your hand, sorry. Um, yeah, do we thank have you, time? Thank you, you are... Do we have time? Yes, um, please, go ahead. Just... Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate all the architects because I think I got the idea that you're working in a, in a country where you, I think you're in, where the political situation doesn't help you much, or we can say that like the conditions, it's kind of like a failed state. And I know what it takes to, to do projects in such conditions. It's really, really hard. And it takes all the efforts from the architects and the, and the urban planners to do everything. Uh, so I do understand you when you showed the video at the end, because this is what happens in my country. It's very hard. We have to reinvent everything from scratch. 
So my question has to do with, with what Dr. Ibarra mentioned at the end, and it's also addressed to everyone that presented from yesterday until today. You talk about a country where you've had, uh, like, from 1985 until now, you've had earthquakes, and this has affected your buildings. And let's say, and, but you presented projects individually. But what happens? Do you ever think about how, and uh, the first one, I forgot the name, excuse me, I think it was, um, the, I forgot the name, who presented at first, who, yeah, they showed the transportation that it's highly congested. And we know that Mexico City is the biggest city in the world. And it, it's, it has the, uh, the highest population in the world. So we're talking about, like, when you want to redesign all this heritage, do you ever think after a huge disaster to have a post-recovery process, post-crisis process, where you have, like, an urban planning with a sustainable urban recovery, and then, like, then you start uh, having a heritage to, do, like, um, I don't know, to redesign these buildings? Like, this is what we're thinking about, like, here in my country, because one third of the buildings got destroyed two years ago. So, like, as uh, Dean Hashim Serkis told us, because we've never thought about the people, he's advising us here in Lebanon to have a civic infrastructure, to think about the humans and the sustainable reconstruction before starting to redesign these heritage buildings, before starting to recover them, to start building the urban fabric right. so this is uh, my question that's what we've been trying to do as an office uh, trying to put projects together in an urban realm and i wanted to address uh, also the urban recycling and that's actually the name of our company it's recycling with an urban uh, core values and understanding the value of, of, of the city of quality of life uh, walkability yeah. public transportation and all that stuff it's very hard as a pr private practice to be able to to change uh, larger parts of the city, but we've managed to change little parts of the city and show the, the government and other investors and other developers alike that it's actually possible that you can, by doing two, three, four projects within the same street or two blocks, you can actually change the urban landscape and, and, and improve people's quality of life. And then more developers tag along. And, and once you do that, you reach that tipping point then everything starts flourishing in a very, I would say, easy way. I mean, if you go to Average Street, the, the street where we actually kind of started, we did three projects. And I think right now there must be like eight to 10 projects uh, 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 added to our three first projects. And everything feels different. It's more secure. It's more lively. There's people walking there almost 24 hours a day. So I think we as architects need to address that uh, in the private sector as developers and also to the government because if we don't correlate or we're not co-responsible of, of what things need to be done then it's just going to be impossible but yeah we, we struggle with the same every day <laughs> yeah it's hard in the third world thank you thank you dana thank you dana where are you actually uh, right now can we know in beirut, in beirut. oh wow beirut. from beirut wonderful <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Anna. We're thank very you. excited to have you, and, and your questions have been uh, great. <laughs> thank you. It was it was a very very nice symposium. Thank you. Okay. Thank well, you much, please stay please stay in touch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Valeria from Mexico, in Mexico City. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Carlos, Gabriela. Pancho, you, of course, uh, Rodrigo, for this wonderful two days. Uh, I wish we could even also record the conversations that we have had outside of, the, of this forum, <laughs> uh, because they have, not all of them, but, you know, it has been very enriching uh, throughout this, uh, this uh, couple of days. Uh, but, well, this is what, what we get. Uh, thank all of you. And, yeah, um, well, let's see. Let's try to... Uh, Stay in touch and perhaps uh, stay tuned because we might organize more of this. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye.